Hello America and the world. Welcome to another episode of Life After Lock Up. Want to say a special hello to all of, of the brothers and sisters, friends that are out at the McCracken County Jail. I uh, want to say hello to you and uh, thank you for watching the program. Been getting some letters uh, from some people that are, are seeing the program and we really hope that the program is encouraging you uh, to know that there is hope and that you can make it after you get out of there. I uh, want to also make sure that you know that at any time you can watch any of the Life After Lockup programs. If you go to paducah2.org, uh, skim, uh, view videos, and look for Life After Lockup. And you can watch any of the programs that are on there. You can call family, friends, call somebody out of state, out of the country, let them know how they can get on the website and watch any of the programs of Life After Lockup. Want to make sure that you also know that if you have anybody, uh, any ideas that you want us to bring up on this program, you can always call me at 270-575-3823. Get some information, ask about our uh, ex-offender support group that meets every Monday, uh, every first Monday at the W.C. Young Community Center at 530. That's uh, the ex-offender support group where we meet. Uh, we try to just have a little, little rap section, support, um, try to find out how you're doing, what you've been doing since you've been out, how, how you've been staying out, and just try to give you some helpful information about being free. Uh, that's every first Monday at the W.C. Young Community Center at 530. Also want to mention about our Lifesaver program. It's a Lifesavers uh, program that meets here at, uh, or actually at the Christ Temple Church at 1130 every Tuesday. It's an eight week course with any life controlling issues. You come by, we talk for an hour from 1130 to 1230. And at the end of the eight weeks, you get a certificate. These certificates are honored uh, by the food stamp office. Uh, if you get out with the drug charge, it helps you uh, to get food stamps. And also uh, for e even uh, some things that's happening to you in court or whatever. But we try to do that for you. It's free, come out and uh, be with us. We're getting ready to start it, a brand new session uh, next week. So come out and join us in that uh, class. This is a very uh, special program today. Um, you, you guys know how uh, I am, how adamant I am about uh, the women that are released from prisons and jails every day uh, that, and the difficulties that they face uh, upon their release. And we have a special guest with us here today, Ms. Felicia Ellison. I want to shake your hand. God bless you. God bless you uh, thank you for being here with us today. And we, we want to really kind of uh, let the people, first of all, kind of know a little bit of your history, your background, um, um, when maybe you got started with the lifestyle that you are now trying to get over. Um, kind of, kind of give us a little background history of, 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 of where you started with, uh, with, with the, uh, the things that you were doing. Uh, my background goes back, way back to 1996 when I caught um, a trafficking cocaine charge okay. nearly 13, 14 years ago. Uh, received a five year sentence for it. Um, I went to prison, went to Pee Wee Valley. I sat in McCracken County Jail for roughly two months. Okay. And, well, I'll take that back, maybe four months. Mm -hmm. And then um, I signed up for a boot camp that they were doing at the time, which was like an 85% guarantee that you make parole okay. and then you had to do that for 120 days it was very very rough okay. I mean it was just like going to boot camp you Real boot might camp. as well been in the army oh, okay. so um, it did help me to lose a lot of weight I oh, can say okay. that <laughs> okay. but um, it was very strict and very disciplined okay. so I did that for 120 days graduated and made parole okay. and I was out for four and a half years, I got down to like two months left of finishing up my parole of this five year sentence mm -hmm. and I got a dirty urine for smoking marijuana. Okay. So with two months left, I'm mm -hmm. thinking, okay, I'll just have to go sit down, you know, go back to jail for two months. Right. And that was not the case because at that time, the time that you were on the street was considered dead weight. Wow. So therefore the four years I had worked down on paper did not count towards any of my time. Oh my and you didn't so, know that? No, I did not. Oh, wow. So um, I ended up doing a total of six months off that time. So I went back to prison, mm. ended up going um, to Pee Wee Valley and then to um, a halfway house, Dismas Charities in Owensboro okay. where I spent the most of my time. I was there roughly six months. Okay made parole and was out again. Um, 
during the first time that after boot camp I had a child, you know, and it was mm -hmm. it was a little rough for me coming out of prison because I came out of prison pregnant with my son. Oh, okay. So I, it was a little rough for me and trying to get back into society, you know, because once you're in the system, to me, you're in the system right. and right. trying to get good jobs is it's really hard. Right. So, you know, I have pretty much had to settle for less okay. and work restaurants or whatnot, work my way up in restaurants into management positions oh, wow. and what and whatnot. But um, by the time my son was probably four, um, I had caught another dirty urine and had to go back where I did six more months. Oh, wow. So um, Coming back from that experience, um, that was roughly around 2002 when I did those last six months mm -hmm. and came back out of prison and I struggled again because each time I've had to go to prison, I've lost everything, everything, pretty much everything and had to start from scratch, you know, finding furniture and bedroom suits and everything and, you know, getting clothes for my kids and stuff and having to stay in shelters. You know, the shelters have helped me out a lot. Good. Um, when I got out in 2002, um, I stayed with my grandmother probably for three, four months, and she didn't make me have to pay her anything. She didn't need any help on her bills, which, you know, anyone can use the extra money, but right. she didn't. She let me save every one of my checks. Great. She was my bank, Good. so, you know, because if I put it in the bank, I was going to go get it back out and buy whatever, but I would just hand her my checks over, keep a little bit out to make sure I got back and forth okay. to work because I was using Pat's bus then because okay. I didn't have a vehicle. And so I had saved up for roughly about $1,500 within wow. three months, wow. and that was with the help of my grandmother. Right. So then I ended up moving into another place. But um, up until now, I mean, I've really struggled, you know, and but welfare helped me a lot. Okay. I was never one that would, like, get on welfare just because I didn't want to work. You know, right. I'd always right. rather work because welfare does not even pay all the bills. The right. welfare I was getting didn't pay all the rent. Right. So there was no choice but to work. So whenever, you know, I might have been in between jobs, I might use a welfare check or right, whatnot right. to help me so I could get established mm -hmm. again. Okay. But with that, with the five-year thing, you know, it, I used to think it was five years for every child. And it's just five years, period. So I thought, you know, whenever I had all my kids are five years apart. Right. So, you know, if I had another child, okay, I got five, five years, years to, you know, okay. to use. But, but you're saying that's not, that's not correct That's not that so. wasn't correct oh, not okay. to my understanding at that time okay. Okay. so um, I've been off welfare for eight years now so okay. I've I've had to work okay. um, in July of 2008 I caught another trafficking charge but this time it was for marijuana okay, um, okay. just stop right there for a minute what what made you st start trafficking or what made you start doing that because it, it seemed was, like you were kind of doing okay um, yeah you do I was doing okay for the most part but then it's like times get hard you mm -hmm. know and being a single parent for the most part it was getting pretty rough on me okay. so you know nine times out of ten I work two jobs right you know and that's wear and tear on my body I'm always tired you know and then you know kids want attention and working right. two jobs I'd rather be sleeping sometimes than paying attention to my kids but I had to you know kindly balance it out so therefore I always had time for my kids and tried to put time away for myself just to rest. Okay, how many children do you have? I have three. three okay. I have a daughter that's 17 and two sons that are 11 and 6. Okay, okay. So my daughter and my 11 year old so son have endured the most part of me going to prison. Okay. So it was rough on them but they were with um, friends and family that okay. did care for them and make sure that they didn't want for anything, you know. Okay. I mean, the people that took care of them took care of them the way I would have taken care okay. of. Okay. But for the most part, they still missed their mom. Right. Okay. And it hurt me a lot because I couldn't be there to give them the motherly support that they always wanted and needed. Right, right. But, so um, this, when, when you, the last trafficking charge, um, trafficking marijuana or whatever, what, why do you feel like you I know you're saying that it was hard and times got difficult because you was working two jobs, mm -hmm. barely getting to sleep, so you just felt like you needed to go make some extra extra money? Yes, um, it was basically for that because, you know, sometimes even working two jobs, there still isn't enough money to pay the bills or right. support the kids. So it just got to the point to where, for me trafficking cocaine, 
I made way more money trafficking cocaine than I did marijuana, but I knew charges were worse than trafficking marijuana. Okay. And of course, I was in the, I had an addiction to okay. marijuana. And, I, and I, was, I was going to ask you about that because your first two were, two things were dirty urine and things yes. like that. So I was going to ask you, you know, did you feel like you had you were addicted to marijuana? Oh, yes. I okay. smoked marijuana on a daily basis. If I did not smoke, I was the type of person you didn't want to be around because it's like it almost leveled me out to where I was calm. But without okay. it, you you couldn't stand to be around me because I was real fussy and real aggravated. So all you the were time. addicted and selling it. Yes. Okay. Yes, mm -hmm. but thinking just because um, what I thought, you know, it carried lesser time because it it's not as potent as right. cocaine. Right. But nowadays that does not matter. Right. So um, I started selling marijuana and the money got really good to mm -hmm. where I was working as well, but I wasn't working as many hours as I was normally working before. Right. I spent more time in the streets, you know, selling the marijuana, and the more money I made, the more I didn't want to stop because we weren't wanting for anything. Right. You know, we got to take little summer vacations, take the kids to, you know, um, Disney World. Uh, not of Disney World, but um, Six Flags, oh, okay. and go to like Holiday World, or just take a weekend and go somewhere, just do something with the kids, just to get away. Right. And then, as far as providing for my kids with me selling marijuana, it wasn't an issue at all. Right. And so, so you were not only addicted to the marijuana, to the smoking, you were addicted also to the to money. To the money, yes. Okay. Very addicted to the money. Okay. Um, but you got caught. But I got caught. And I did 97 days and I lost pretty much everything again. I had some things that were still salvaged that my sister, you know, was able to keep for me. So I didn't have to buy everything all over again. But that was a major stepping stone. Okay. Once I got out in October of 2008, um, social services would not let me get my kids back until I was able to obtain reasonable housing and to be able to pay my bills for two months mm. on my own before they would let them come home. That was a major struggle because here I am again having to save up this money mm. to get a place. Right. You know, nowadays rent is not cheap, so the cheapest rent I could find to have adequate room for my children and myself five hundred dollars a month wow. rent five hundred dollar deposit and wow. with you know getting your utilities cut on, you're looking mm. at another three hundred dollars so wow. thirteen hundred dollars i had to strive for mm. but okay just just um what how come did you try to go to get housing at that time i, mean, I did out? try to um get housing but i was denied because of my charge okay um i was told that uh, I wouldn't be eligible for housing again until my charge was at least five years old. But before, when I had caught the cocaine charge, mm -hmm. rules were different. Um, 13 years ago, when I caught the charge, well, let me go, okay, when I first caught the charge in 96, rules were different. When I um, came from prison in 1998 and applied for housing, then all you had to do, if you was a felon, and as long as you didn't owe them any other money, right you could pay a $500 deposit and move back in. Okay. So I thought that would be the case this time, but rules have changed again since then. Okay. So it's, I might still have to pay a $500 deposit, you know, if they do let me in. But right. I mean, that's unknown to me at this time because I've tried last year before I moved into my house to get housing and I was denied. And they told me five years. Five years after, I mean, since five years. From the date of my charge. From the date of the crime, mm -hmm. five years. So that means to, until 2013, I couldn't move in there. But um, I did come to one of your ex-offender meetings when Housing Authority was there and they, you know, told them my story and how right. I got to move in before. And they told me to reapply and okay. we could see where we could go. So I reapplied again um, a few months ago. Mm -hmm. And I was denied again. So one of the property managers told me to appeal it okay. and he was going to set up an appointment for me to go through an appeal process because since it is obvious to them now that I am trying to change my life because I had been working two jobs, right. but I stopped working two jobs and continued to work one to go to school. Okay. And he was like, it's you know, evident that I'm trying to change right. my life. Right. So, but I'm still waiting on that appeal Sometimes. letter for a date, you know, so mm -hmm. that I can go through the process. Okay, let me, let me back up just a few minutes here because I'm, um, before, even though you had you had charges and everything, and you you didn't it didn't seem like you was kind of learning. Like you you still smoking, and you, then you started back mm -hmm. to trafficking or whatever. What made things change this time? Now you're still on 
probation right now, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, is the probation the reason that you are trying to change some things, or what is what is causing you to? Um, because you mentioned you work in, you were working two jobs and going to school. Mm -hmm. um, what is causing you to um, maybe take this road now of trying to get away from that lifestyle into something different? First and foremost, I have God in my life more than I've ever had God in my life. God is my strength okay. for now, you know, for now and forever. Okay. Um, Going to your church, you all have supported me in so many ways that I have not had that type of support before, you know, and just, just the advice and being able to come back to talk. Okay. Because I can't say that I haven't contemplated going back to selling cocaine or marijuana because times have still been hard. Okay. Um, and and, and you just, just stopping right there because I know your situation a little bit um, because, you know, you're right there, but uh, here you are. You, you you had a house. You mm -hmm. were paying $500 mm -hmm. a, a month and uh, rent, and you some, some, somehow you began to struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, things wasn't working out like you mm -hmm. wanted them to, to and uh, you, had, you lost that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, um, that's where, this is where I guess the question that I'm, and I know people are wanting to kind of know, okay, here you are now, you lost your house. What's keeping you from going back? Um, I don't have any more jail time or prison time in me to do. Uh, I'm 33 years old. My kids are getting older. And the big picture is it's, it's, it's not worth it. You know, I'd rather struggle out here and try to make ends meet than to sit in jail or prison and wondering how my kids are doing or if, you know, they're being provided for. I need to be here. I mean, I'm just getting too old for it. And it's... Finally, I've like just put my foot down. You know, I have to do what I have to do. So that's why I went back to school, so that way I can obtain a better job, right. you know, and be able to provide better, you know, have better wages, okay. insurance or whatnot. So that is the big picture right there because you I, just, you just freedom feel, is just more to me than being able to having to lay down and think about what I did wrong to end up back in jail. Okay. You know, okay. that's just not an option for me anymore. Like I said, I'd rather endure the struggle than to be sitting behind somebody's bars mm -hmm. and just wondering what what what's going on in life that I'm missing out on while I'm locked down. Right. And and that is that is so important because and, and I and I tell people all the time, I think there there comes a point in time when everybody whether they've been in and out of prison for years and years and years, there, there comes a point in time when everybody will eventually click and say, okay, enough is enough. Right, and enough is enough for me. And, and even though you are struggling because you end up losing your home and uh, um, you know, everybody knows you know, we have this Jumpstart uh, program mm -hmm. that um, now you are involved in. Yes. And, and, and I, I, I'm concerned about that because, you know, Thank God we were we were able to have that oh, for yes. you and your your three children and 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 I'm I'm bringing this up not for to pat us on the back because for that because for why we only had me in there mm -hmm. so thank God we were we were able to have you know mm -hmm. uh, an opportunity for you to come um, and and we we this is what what we did our organization not Christ Temple Church but our organization Life Community we we had rules mm -hmm. and no children were in our rules right. But because we saw a need, we broke our own rules. Right. And, and I'm saying that because sometimes rules have to be altered mm -hmm. for the, the welfare of the people. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at your situation, looking at the housing authority rules, and come to find out in that meeting that you mentioned, I thought it was a state rule. Come to find out it wasn't a state rule, but it's federal. Mm -hmm. So some kind of way, you know, we're going to have to get to the federal people right. some kind of way and get them to take a real good look at these rules that they are putting out. What are you supposed to do in five years? You know what I'm saying? If, if you have to wait five years before you can get some type of affordable housing, mm -hmm. you know, here a single mom with three children mm -hmm. that desperately need a roof over their head. Yes. You know, what are you supposed to do in, in five years if they can't uh, alter the rules for you? And that's a good question because I feel like once you're in the <clears throat> system, you're labeled, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like 
when you're getting out and doing good, it's like who looks at you trying to change your life? Right. You know, right. it's like you just have this label on you. You're an offender. Mm -hmm. You know, you're a felony. Right. You keep a, fel a persistent felony offender, mm -hmm. as they would put it. So it's like what what can you do to you know how much do you have to prove to let them know you know you're trying to change your life give me a chance whether it be getting a job right. or whether it be getting in housing or something else right. you know because um even with me going to school what i'm going for i'm still gonna have i would i might say some prejudices against me because i have drug trafficking felonies okay. you know so that that's still going to be a struggle so but what are you going to school for I'm going to school for business administrative technology, oh, okay. but also in my field, they would teach me how to open up and run my own business. Okay. So talking to my counselors or whatnot, that might be what I have to do. Okay. So I might have to start my own business rather than go work for someone else and, and manage their business for them. Okay. So, I mean, that's just part of what I call the hard knock life that, you know, you go through with the decisions that I made, they weren't very bright decisions, but I have learned from them. It might've taken a couple of times, but mm -hmm. I've truly learned from them and it's just not worth it at all. And I think, you know, you said something, uh, this man just hit me like a pow, you know, as, uh, you, the choices that you were making were not very wise choices. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's unfortunate that we, and I say we because you know everybody knows I'm an, I'm an ex-con, it, it, it's unfortunate that we have to make unwise choices mm -hmm. that affect our lives mm -hmm. later. Yes. You know, and, and, and even though, like, you know, you have a, you have a, have a daughter and you, got, you have other young people that are looking at this program, some in prison right now, mm -hmm. that are probably feeling like, well, you know, I'm not going to be as dumb as she was. I'm not going to be dumb as he was. I'm not going to get caught. Um, I'll be all right. You know, what would you what would you say to that young girl that's out there slinging uh, uh, drugs out there on the streets? What would you what would you say to her? What would I say? Uh, well, because for me, it was more for the glamour or whatnot, mm -hmm. being able to buy nice things or whatnot. Um, the circumstances that you have to face upon that are not worth it. I mean you appreciate things that you work for more. Right. And right. that you have to, you know, you might have to put up a little bit here and save for a while, but you'll appreciate it more and it'll last longer. Um, the dope mm -hmm. game is it's just not guaranteed. It doesn't last forever and you will eventually get caught. Having that I won't Man. get caught attitude, that's just not, it's a fairy it's, tale. It's exactly a fairy mm -hmm. tale. And that's, man, that is so good because I don't know, I don't know a whole lot of people that are in the game like that that have not done so much time and that are either dead or prison or something like that. This a, it's a dead end in And Rome. let me just tell you, when you don't have all that money and all those nice clothes and nice cars and stuff anymore and you are working for what you need and want so that you can appreciate it, a lot of those people that were surrounded were surrounding you when you had all those nice things, they're not going to be around anymore. <laughs> Man, that they're is... not going to be around anymore. They'll be the ones looking down at you, oh, she's struggling now, and mm -hmm. she's not doing as good as she was, and they're just not going to be there. Mm -hmm. But if, you know, even with saving and working for for what you need and want and being able to prosper in that way, mm -hmm. when they see that you're, um, what's the word I'm looking for? When they see that you're starting to do better, right. they might start trying to come back around because they, then they're going to be curious, well, what is she doing now, right, you know? Right. It's, but to all the young people, it, it's not worth it. You'll just be wasting your life and time flies by. They say out of sight, out of mind. And mm -hmm. usually when you're in jail, that is so true. Out of sight, out of mind. Mm, and, and that is so important because uh, I can relate to that uh, because I was the guy that that was the, the uh, party bringer. I was the one that that brought all everything around. Mm -hmm. Then mm -hmm. uh, I was in prison for three years and some months. And all the friends that I thought I had never got a letter, never mm -hmm. got never got a dime put on my put on my mm -hmm. books. All those kind of things. Everybody disappeared. Oh yeah. And 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 you won't know who your real friends are until you are out of out of sight. That's right. And and and, and it is important. Even though you know we're older now, and you know you you you're struggling, and but. With the struggle, the thing that things that you are doing, you're working, you're going to school, you mm -hmm. are preparing yourself mm -hmm. for better. Mm -hmm. And the one main thing, even though you know this is not a religious program, but the main thing that you said that which is the reality of it all, having God in your life. Yes. You know, it it is better now with Him in your life than when He wasn't there. Exactly. Even though I've been through struggle, each struggle that I go through 
it only makes me stronger. That's the way mm -hmm. I see it, you know. And then someone else might go through something similar that I've been through, then I can relate to them like and let them know, you know, it gets better. It right. just takes time, you know. Just because we can't have what we want or get what we need when we want it, we can eventually get it. Exactly. I mean it's just having a having some faith exactly. and 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 depending on God. Man, and that is that is so important because here's here's what I tell people all the time. You can never go wrong by doing right. That's right. As long as you're doing the right thing, you're gonna eventually get right results. That's right. But Wrong never turns out right. Never. And and and, it, and it's so important for people to under, to understand that. And even with your struggle, God is opening doors for you that I thought would never be open. Right. And and and, and 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 that's important because mm -hmm. you're seeing that mm -hmm. even in the struggle, things can always be worse. And 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 now that in the midst of the struggle. You can see you can see God in it, oh, yes. and you can see Him working, and it's 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 giving you peace because I know where you are. I I know the struggles that probably would have caused you to just say, uh, "Okay, I'm through." Throw your hands up, mm -hmm. throw the mm -hmm. towel in, and go backwards. Yes. But you are holding on. You're still doing the right thing. You are 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 moving forward, mm -hmm. and and that's commendable. Even with the doors that are being slammed in your face, mm -hmm. you are still hanging on and God is still opening other doors. That's right. And and, and it's important and, and I'm and I'm watching you develop. I'm watching you grow. I'm watching you hold on. Even with your with your your three children. I'm I'm watching and I even see them. They seem to be adjusting. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and because they know it gets better. Because, like I said, this isn't the first time we've had to live in like a shelter home, mm -hmm. you know. And so they they can adjust, and they know that I'm trying and everything that I'm doing, you know. Sooner or later, we'll be back in our own place or whatnot, and then things will get better. But my kids, they're they're really good kids, and they do adjust and they help me out. You know, they don't stress me out or good. anything like that. Good, so, good. you know. They help around the house or whatever, especially my older daughter. You know, she helps right. with the boys. You know, if I have sometimes I have to work graveyard shifts and I'm gone from six at night to six in the morning. Mm. You know, so she I have to help take care of the boys and you know make sure that they get eat and bathe and everything, right. get in the bed. So well, well, God has really has really helped you and He's still helping you. And I see uh, a great future for you as long as you keep doing what you're doing, oh, keep yes. doing the right thing. And I want to mention to all of you uh, that have shelters that, are, that have houses or whatever. Think about helping somebody, helping to uh, uh, give somebody hope for, for the future. And I want to say, um, I know our time is just about up, and I really want to uh, let you know how much I appreciate you for watching this program. And I want to thank you thank so you. much for joining us. Thank you for sharing your story with us, and thank you for listening to uh, and watching Life After Lockup. And you have a marvelous day.